Australian as a meat pie and just as appetising. And if you're under 23, you wouldn't know life without them. It began in a garage in Chatswood, you know, when we were students and um, trying to find a way out of our respective careers, I think, you know, and play music. That was back in 1971. The band was called Farm, consisted of Jim Magini, Rob Hurst, Andrew Bear James, and later on Peter Garrett. In 1976, guitarist Martin Rossi joined the lineup, and Midnight Oil was born. It's just a of sex now. Like all garage bands, we were destined to stay there. We got a, a few gigs around town. We used to play the Chatswood Charles Hotel. The promoter's name was Jason Wilde. He used to turn up, you know, with his big '70s hairdo and a pink suit, and um, it looked like everything was going to explode on us because. He used to get us these shows, but we would never get paid. But eventually, I remember we were starting to build up a bit of a crowd at the Antler, and um, and we got up on stage. But rather than launching into one of the early versions of Surfing with a Spoon or Paddleworks or something, Pete turned to the audience and said, this arsehole hasn't paid us yet, we're not playing another note until he does. <laughs> Which sort of defined, you know, the attitude of the band ever since. Releasing their debut album in 1978, Midnight Oil, or the Blue Album, as it became known, peaked at 43. Despite chart success, it was not plain sailing. We got rejected a lot, you know, and we got told to give up, mate, and, you know, get a day job, and he can't sing, and who's this wanker, you know, and so all that stuff. And then all the smart A&R people and really fancy offices with fantastic stereo systems, you know, and like piles and piles of cassettes and things like that. That's, you haven't got it, you know. But they did have it. Album number two, Head Injuries, was backed up with awesome live shows, which quickly gained them a large fan base. In 1980, Peter Gifford stepped in on bass, and the new lineup released the EP Bird Noises. Heading to London in 81, they returned with the album, Place Without a Postcard, which features powerful songs like I Don't Want to Be the One and Armistice Day. Some say Place Without a Postcard was a turning point for the Oils, with the energy and passion of their live shows and powerful lyrical statements. This was a band with a political mission, or was it? The members of the band were also passionately interested in Australia, our country. So that's been construed over the time, I think, or misconstrued as the band started as a bunch of activists and thought the best way to get that message across was to learn a few guitar chords and, and, and play the drums and sing. And sing they did. They may not have been activists joining a band, but nonetheless, they had a message. Album number four, Ten to One, was appropriately titled Blasting the Band into Superstardom. Garrett's amazing physical contortions and songs like US Forces, Short Memory and Power and the Passion went off. By 84, Midnight Oil were as hot as the Simpson Desert and so too was the album Red Sails in the Sunset, which went to number one. 1985 and another number one hit with the EP Species to Ceases. The next few years made history. The 86 tour of the Outback with Aboriginal rock act the Warumpi Band became the subject of both a TV documentary and a book. The impact and experience of the tour on the band resulted in yet another number one album, 1987's Diesel and Dust. The Oils were now a major commercial success all over the world. Three shows in Radio City Music Hall, Midnight Oil sold out, sold out, sold out. In 1989, after a long tour, the Oils, with new bass player Bones Hillman, headed to Sydney to record Blue Sky Mining. Blue Sky Mining became their fourth number one. Tracks recorded during another successful tour in the early 90s resulted in the blistering live album Scream in Blue. 1993's Earth and Sun and Moon was a little different. Never think that the character of Rob Hurst or, or Peter Garrett or Jim Magini or Martin Rotzi or Bones Hillman spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, the thickness of their guitar strings or, you know, a certain reverberation of a certain amp that you use to make a song. But those things are things which we take very seriously. In 96, the album Breathe marked two decades of touring and recording for Midnight Oil. Also that year, Rob Hurst's side project Ghost Riders released their first album. Rob's not the only oil to have side projects. Jim Magini is in Fuzzface and Bones Hillman, The Hunting Party. Side projects aside, who are Midnight Oil? 
got, you know, Rob's the historian. He's very serious. Jim's intense in every aspect of the whole thing. Martin's a silent one, but when he opens his mouth, it's deadly. And I'm the jester. And everyone loves the jester bones, especially when you're celebrating your 21st birthday. And what better way to do it than release the album 20,000 Watt RSL and tour the country. So what's the secret to lasting this long? This is our life, you know, this is what we do. And they just keep on doing it. Magic might not be the right word for the 1998 album Redneck Wonderland, but nevertheless it does have a spell on it. Not surprising really as the country was heading for a federal election, just the kind of inspiration needed for an oils album. In 23 years, Midnight Oil have travelled the world and written some of the most powerful songs. So if you had to describe Midnight Oil, how would you do it? It's a band. I always say Midnight Oil is a band. You know, people try and write a lot more in that we're some kind of social force of right justice and recycle milk cartons and help old ladies across the road and do this and don't do that. But we're a band. You know? But we address certain issues which other people shy away from because we write crappy love songs.